very good. I think everyone's already in. Welcome everyone. Um, if you can hear me well, could you maybe do a bit of a reaction? Um, nice. Okay. So we have good audio. Welcome to the first event of the Health Summit of the European Youth Parliament. I'm Isa. I am one of the project managers at the International Office um, of the EYP, and I manage the health project that we are running this year. Um, so the European Youth Parliament, as many of you know, um, its mission is to empower young Europeans to become open, tolerant and active citizens. Uh, citizens. And we do this by creating spaces for young people to form their opinions, to exchange uh, views and also to interact with decision makers and um, yeah. Um, so that is also the goal of the, of the Health Summit. And this year that has been less than ideal for, for many of us, has also been a bit of a struggle for, for the EYP and I think in general for, for all these platforms that encourage uh, debate and participation, it has made it uh, way more difficult uh, for us to organize events, to meet up, uh, to travel and to get together. And yet uh, we managed and the network came together. We did a series of events uh, that have happened digitally and the Health Summit is the manifestation of everything that has come about from this whole process. Um, so for us, it's a very proud moment uh, to be here and present what we've been doing this year in the Health Project um, with a special support from the Wellcome Trust. And I have here with me today three great speakers uh, who will be presenting, who will be sharing some words with you, and then we will be having a discussion about what the Health Summit is. So the purpose of sharing this paper that we, sorry? Okay, I have no, okay. Um, could someone repeat whatever they said about me? No, all right. Um, thanks for the shout out. I'll assume it was something about my great speech. Um, yeah, so the purpose of the, this launch event at the Health Summit is to present the paper and the contents of, um, of the Health Project, and on the other hand, to talk about active citizenship and how we can amplify youth voices in this shrinking spaces. Um, and the three speakers that I have with me uh, today are Joe Alporn from the European Youth Firm. He's the Secretary General. He will be sharing a keynote with us. Uh, shortly, I have Richard Hartlaub from the Wellcome Trust from the Germany office. Uh, he's policy advisor and he's been cooperating closely with me in this project. Um, so I extend my thank yous and my appreciation uh, to the Wellcome Trust um, and also Marek Navratil from the Czech Republic, a long term EY peer and also massive contributor to the project. He moderated the think tank that put together the paper that we will be presenting today. Uh, and he will also be sharing his views on how this, yeah, what this means for the EYP and for active participation. We will also be sharing a video statement that we got from the German Ministry of Health, uh, from the German minister um, Jens Spahn, um, to whom I send my appreciation and best wishes. And without further ado, I invite Joe to share some words with you. Thanks, Joe, for being here. Super, thank you. Um, so I was asked just to put together uh, a few minutes of, of thoughts. Obviously, the, the European Youth Forum and the European Youth Parliament have collaborated in various ways across um, the years. And um, it's really great to, to be here. And thank you to, to, to Anya and everyone for, for inviting me. Um, first off, I think I want to, to sort of congratulate the people who, who decided to take on health um, as, a, as a challenge. Um, health and healthcare is, is a bit of a monster. Um, 
it's so clear if you if you look at health um, and, and the systems around it that there are so many failings um, in the way the systems are done. If you look at the NHS in the UK, they still use Windows 95. If you look at the price of insulin in America, it's multiplied uh, its price by 1000 percent, even though it was it ran out of patent a long time ago. In fact, never actually even had a patent. Um, so there are so many ways to improve, which seems so obvious, yet improvement is really tough. It's really difficult. And the reason is because there are so many powerful and vested interests in health and healthcare. You've got doctors who don't want to change. You've got big corporations who make incredible amounts of money. You've got huge numbers of people employed doing the things that they're doing. And they all man man massively benefit from the system the way it is. The problem is that system is broken. And what is so important is bringing fresh perspective into that system. And that is where youth voice can be so powerful and is so important. And youth voice can bring innovation in the, in the truest sense of the word. If you, if you look at any healthcare, health tech company, innovation is all over their websites. But whenever you really challenge them for innovation um, in the way of their systems and um, in the way that they do their business, um, that you find that there's a lot less excitement um, in, in general. Now, I, you mean, I think the, the, the one thing that everyone around this phone could be thinking is sort of like, well, yeah, there's there these mega corporations who make billions of euros every single month. Um, how can we as a small group of, of young people um, have any effect on that? How can we actually affect change? How can we make it better? How can we, how can we make it so it's actually possible to just do a Skype phone call with a doctor and get them to send you an e-prescription that you can pick up at your local pharmacy? Like that's totally doable, but literally you try and implement any of that and you will raise hell <laughs> because no one wants to do it. Um, in order to kind of give you a, give you a sort of, uh, a small story. Um, I'm going to steal something from a from a great speaker called called Simon Sinek about um, underdogs um, doing big changes. So on December seventeenth, uh, nineteen o three, something absolutely incredible happened on planet Earth. For the first time ever, a man-made object took flight, and it flew for a very 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 short amount of time, about four minutes but it changed the absolute world and it should never have happened. So some of you may have heard the story of the Wright brothers and it's absolutely fascinating and I'll not go into it too much today. But what's remarkable is they were never meant to succeed. At the time that the Wright brothers did the first powered flight on planet Earth, there was another team uh, led by a guy called Samuel Langley who had a really fancy university department he had another team working on it, and they had all the smartest physicists and scientists that were available to him in America. He was financed by huge amounts of money at that time, 50,000 euros, which doesn't sound much more today, but back then it was an incredible amount of money. And he was on a mission to do powered flight. At the same time, there was the Wright brothers. No one paid attention to them. They had no funding. They worked out of a bike shed, yet they beat the massive system to the solution. What's even more crazy is whenever they actually made, made it um, and they built this flying machine, people didn't even pay any attention. They invited people to see it and they were like, ah, oh, this is just a fluke. And they had to even leave America and go to France um, to try and shoo their flying machine off. But they stayed true to their conviction. And as history shows, they, they created the world of aviation today. Every single person on this phone has been part of the Wright brothers story. Every single one of us, every time we've gotten an Airbus or a Boeing airplane has got there because the Wright brothers solved something, but they were massively outgunned. They were against vested interests who had every interest in ignoring their, 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 their success. And I think that there's some lessons for that in how we approach healthcare and especially healthcare from a youth voice and, and system change point of view. For me, there's sort of two lessons. Number one is vested interest can be really powerful and scary, but it can't beat the right answer. 
and and that's important. Um, now, where do you find truth? Where do you find those right answers? And, and I think that more often than not, it's from people from the outside looking into a system and saying, why is that happening? Or, or why is that wrong? Or can you not make that much easier? And, and that's where I think youth voice has such an amazing potential. And the second thing is, even if you do find the right answer, it's a really long journey to make that answer happen. And again, for, 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 for the youth parliament who is sort of starting to test out this new area of like producing content and, and trying to affect change, it won't happen overnight. It's gonna be a long journey. Um, the youth forum obviously fights on lots of the similar issues. Um, it took us, we, we've been going on about un unpaid internships for well over a decade. And it took us until a few weeks ago before we actually got a final vote on, on this thing. Um, so it's not an easy road, it's a long road. Um, so my encouragement to everyone here today is, is be prepared to walk that longer journey. Um, it's, it's, it's painful sometimes, it's exciting other times, and especially in health and healthcare. It's, 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 it, as I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a big thing. But I'm completely convinced that the more youth voice that we have in this space, the better, because we've got to change stuff, um, because the health systems are not functioning as they could. Regardless, even if you're not successful, uh, which, I, which, I, which I hope you're not, but the uh, even act of engaging in this forum is, is important and positive. You're participating. And my only ask really today is everyone who's gone through any of this experience or if you're, you're sort of looking at this for the first time and going, wow, that was a cool thing. Don't just get involved yourself. Go find someone and get them involved too. It is absolutely critical that we start rebalancing what is our shrinking civil space. Um, certainly the youth forums a bit here to, to support on those kinds of journeys. Um, for example, we're, we're just about to relaunch an initiative with the UN Youth Envoy called Not Too Young to Run, where we're encouraging loads of young people to run for office. Um, there's been some wonderful success stories out of America um, I, I mean, uh, one of the questions is how do you engage uh, or how do you increase youth participation? The simple answer is elect Trump, I think. <laughs> it's, um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, it, we can change stuff. And, and we, we, we as the youth forum are there to support a bit on that. There's also sort of data, which is a difficult one, sort of policymakers and others always ask for more data, more data. And, and even if you give them data, you, they'll ask for more data. <laughs> and that's sort of how they, how they go about it. But what you can certainly do is there's, there's lots of points with the, which the youth forum can support some of your objectives. So for example, um, we've just done a, a relatively large study on the shrinking civil space where there's sort of data points on how different youth organizations feel that they are, are, are listened to or, or whether they're worried about congregating or, 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 or producing things. And we've also got a sort of quite helpful global index um, called the Youth Progress Index, which looks at how in lots of different categories, youth is progressing um, in various parts of the world. So, Again, what I wanted to do was just highlight as you go on your journey and you sort of take this, this document of, of lots of different policy recommendations and, and ideas, and, and many of them are, are really good. Um, as you go and take them places, don't get caught in that trap of give me more data, like use some stuff which is already existing and say, yeah, yeah, you, we don't need more data. You just need to take us more seriously. Um, so just to close, you mean, I think that um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm really happy to see more people in, in the youth space speaking up about health. Um, I think it's a, a smart way to do it in sense of you can either go really horizontal like what the Youth Forum does and sort of speak up for, for 40 million people we represent, or you can try and slice it up and like take it thing by thing um, and like picking health and especially with given the pandemic um, is, is, is a really interesting space to, 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 to explore. And um, you mean, now's the tough bit. You've got you've to take your document. You've got to speak about it a hundred, maybe a thousand times to start trying to embed the ideas within it. Um, and you're going to be, there's going to be some good company there. You mean your concepts and ideas around digitization, for example, is obviously going in the, the way that, that, that sort of industrial communities are going um, in the med tech space. It's also definitely where 
a lot of a lot of a lot of um, systems are looking at sort of telehealth and telemedicine and things like that. So there is a real opportunity nowadays, um, and I can only say that the Youth Forum is is also here a bit to support you um, in 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 achieving those goals. So I hope that that's sort of a, a very very short introduction um, from our side. Hopefully, one or two helpful useful resources. I'll maybe send some of that stuff to Anya. Um, and she can she can she can circulate them, um, but I really wish you all all the luck in the world on your journey, and and hope you guys in in your own healthcare way can build your own flying machines and beat those vested interests. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for the encouragement. Is definitely it's indeed going to be a very long way, and I think we're ready for you know to overcome the challenges. It's also been as, as we said, a little bit of a trial uh, for us, and especially with this topic, um, which is very timely, and I think it's, it's here to stay as well. Um, so on that note, I will pass on to Richard uh, from the Welcome Trust, and as they are partners in this big endeavor that has been keeping me busy this year. Um, so Richard, whenever you're ready. Um, thanks, Angel. Um, and it, it certainly is an endeavour that's not just um, been keeping you busy, it's been keeping me and I think everybody here at Belcom and probably quite a lot of people around the world um, quite busy. I mean, not specifically by PD, but, um, but COVID as a whole. Um, yeah, as, as Isa said, my name is Richard Hartlow. I work for the Belcom Trust. Um, we are one of the UIP's funding partners um, for this series of health-related events that, um, that has been taken place over the year. Um, maybe just a few quick words about Welcome. Um, they're an independent charitable foundation um, headquartered in London, but as Isa said, um, I work in our Germany office in Berlin, um, and we were sort of founded in, in the 1930s. And the purpose, as you can see on this beautiful banner behind me, um, is to improve health worldwide by making great ideas thrive. And the way we do that in practice is um, that they're mostly a research funder. So um, in terms of the story of the Wright brothers um, versus, versus Langley, we're, uh, we're the university department, so to speak. Um, but so I don't think that doesn't mean that we don't have that outside of perspective and that we don't see um, that things obviously kind of aren't right um, the way they're going. Um, I thought maybe briefly to outline where we, where we overlap with, uh, with the policy paper that we have in front of us today, um, because there is quite a lot of overlap and I think that, that makes this partnership a really exciting one. Um, obviously, our mission is to improve health worldwide and, and that fits incredibly well with, um, with a paper called Improving Health and Wellbeing for All. Um, and they're active across, I think, all four of the policy areas that are outlined in the policy paper. So, as we speak, we're doing some thinking um, about the future of global health governance, because I think it's, it's quite clear to everyone that um, the way that is currently going um, cannot and will not be the way forward after this pandemic and that we need wholesale change. Um, they're actively promoting access, for example, um, for our membership in the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, which is this um, amazing global corporation uh, to speed up research um, into therapeutics, vaccines and diagnostics against COVID-19, but also um, an initiative that tries to make sure that everybody everywhere, regardless of their ability to pay, um, can have access to these tools. Because um, we've heard it a million times, but it's still true, as long as we haven't defeated COVID-19 everywhere, we haven't defeated it anywhere. Um, Infectious diseases is, is one of the pillars of our new strategy. So another area where we're going to be massively active over the next few years, um, especially neglected tropical diseases. Um, health innovation is another very important area to us. Um, and just this year, we've set up a new entity called Welcome Leap. Um, and the purpose of that entity is to fund the kind of, yeah, the kind of the right brothers, the disruptive innovation, um, the kind of stuff we need that really um, pushes pushes us forward in our quest um, for better health globally. Um, and lastly, mental health is another pillar of our strategy. Um, and here we're focusing especially on, on the struggles of young people and especially on kind of figuring out what sort of intervention actually can work um, and can help us improve young people's mental health. So because we are a research funder, um, 
they're not necessarily always very good in, in engaging young people. Um, you know, quite a lot of research is, is being done by people who are sort of probably twice my age. Um, obviously, you've got, you've got the younger people as well, but, you know, they are only just getting started. So um, we try to give their careers a push. Um, but yeah, ultimately, a lot of the money goes, goes to um, demographics other than young people. So I think for us, this is a really exciting partnership because it helps us get that kind of um, systematic engagement with, with young people who are open to new ideas, who, who have kind of that energy, who, who want to really change things. Um, and I think for us, that's incredibly valuable and incredibly fruitful. Um, and on the other hand, we can be kind of like a sparring partner um, for you to kind of give you input, um, to discuss some ideas. Um, and also, and I think that is one that is not to be underestimated, um, to help amplify the ideas that you already have. Um, because ultimately, um, we in many conversations are one of the voices that have a seat at the table in a way um, that young people unfortunately very often don't. Obviously, um, it's a bit strange to, to just um, speak to, I think, approximately 10 faces on my screen and, and a few um, names that I can see in, in white on black here on Zoom. Um, that's, of course, um, the only way we can do this due to, due to COVID-19, um, which is unfortunate, but um, is quite a nice segue into, into the other few remarks that I wanted to make. Um, and that is that I think COVID-19 has kind of helped shine a really bright light on, on many divisions and problems that we as society, or rather as, as societies, um, already have. And, and that kind of includes difficulties in engaging young people and making sure that young people get the seat at the table, get their voices heard, um, get their opinions taken seriously, as Joe said. Um, so as an example, obviously I'm in Berlin, so I'm, I'm most familiar with probably the German context. Um, here in Germany, youth at the moment is kind of cast in, in this role as sort of the unruly demographic um, in scare quotes that kind of doesn't stick to the rules. You know, here in Berlin over the summer, there was this huge thing about um, young people meeting for illegal raves and like, you know, everybody not wearing masks and sweating and dancing and sharing drinks and stuff. Um, and so basically young people are one of the, of the demographics that, um, that are being blamed for their contribution to the second wave. And similarly, um, in Britain, many young people have been brought back into universities um, in person. Predictably, there were flare-ups in universities. Um, and rather than like, blaming an obviously broken system, their universities have to rely on, on raking in the fees from young people. Um, and that is what made them, you know, uh, make young people go back to uni. Um, so rather than blaming these systemic issues, um, predictably everyone went the easy way and, and blamed the young people um, for the flare-ups. I'm obviously being a bit polemic and I should say, uh, just to cover my own backside, that this is probably not the official welcome position here, but anyways, here we go. Um, so, and I think obviously that framing of young people as, as part of the problem is extremely problematic in itself. So. First of all, um, it kind of just out of hand vilifies an entire and, and really diverse demographic group, um, which, which probably, you know, also doesn't help kind of mend that rift um, that I think there already is in, in society between young people and older demographics. Um, it also ignores, as I just alluded to, um, and, and as Joe has alluded to in his speech indeed, um, that many of the issues um, that are being blamed on young people in Terralia um, are symptomatic of, on the one hand, a kind of more systematic loss of, of societal coherence that I think we've been seeing over the last um, decades. Um, and obviously they also stem from the kind of retreat of the state and, and from, from the shrinking um, space for sort of civil engagement and, and civil exchange that we're seeing. So um, like you may have seen um, the memes about, about the restrictions in Great Britain, you know, that you can't actually meet anywhere that doesn't have a till. Um, but in many places, there isn't anywhere that, have, that doesn't have a till where you could meet because that kind of public space just isn't there anymore. And that's how you end up with um, kind of eight people in a one bedroom flat. Um, and that's how you get a fresh new infection hotspot. Um, 
And lastly, what this kind of vilification um, fails to take into account is that young people can be part of the solution and that I think, in fact, young people um, have to be part of the solution. Young people can be part of the solution in that, admittedly, I think, you know, sometimes young people are harder to reach as a demographic um, than older demographics because, you know, they, they consume different media, they kind of, um, they kind of are active in different circles and so on and so forth. Um, but that shouldn't mean that we just, you know, go the easy route and go, oh, it's good enough for everyone else. Why is it not good enough for youth? It means that we, you know, we need to make an actual effort to, to kind of get on eye level um, with young people. And I think one way that can be done is um, by looking for young people who are already active, who are already engaged, who are already being sort of active citizens, I think much in the way as, as all of you here are, um, and ask them for their help effectively, because um, we, we will not be able to, to reach young people if we just, um, yeah, kind of don't really make an effort. Um, and obviously also that helps us empower these young people that we use um, to, to educate and, and inform um, and engage their peers. But young people cannot just be engaged. I think, in fact, young people must be engaged. So this pandemic, grim as it is, um, is also a unique opportunity for changing the trajectory of what the future is going to look like. Um, and as Joe said, vested interests, especially in health and in healthcare, are incredibly strong. They are everywhere. Um, they are incredibly hard to overcome. And in fact, they are already starting to kind of encroach that space that we have right now to remake our futures um, because they are the forces of the status quo and they don't want change. And that's something that I think we need to overcome and that the fresh perspective and the energy that young people can bring um, are, are required to overcome. Um, so, you know, we need a system that's going to be fit for the future. The next pandemic is definitely going to come. We need to be prepared for it. Um, and we need to kind of build back better, um, as it were, but we need to build back better in a way that also makes the system work better for everybody and not just make the system work better for those who are already doing well. And again, this is something where, where the voices from young people are incredibly important. And I think um, quite a lot of, of um, the proposals in the policy paper are in that space. And this is, again, an opportunity for Welcome, I think, to, to work as an amplifier um, for these voices, because often we do have that seat at the table and we have the ear of, um, of the decision makers. But also, as Joe said, it's not going to be easy. You're in this, if you're in it, for the long run. It's going to be a real slog. Um, and we here at Belcom and Joe at the European Youth Forum, we can do our part, but it will also need kind of viewer sustained engagement. And we need you to engage not just with us and not just with policy makers, but also with your peers. You know, we need to sort of, I think, Build a, build a movement that's as, as broad as possible. And in many areas like climate change, that is already happening. And I think now is the time to make this kind of coalition building and this kind of really active vocal um, citizenship um, happen in health. And I think this whole series of events has been uh, great and has been a step in the right direction. And we at Welcome have been more than happy to support it. And I think we'll be more than happy to support it going forward. Um, but I just want to encourage all of you um, to not drop the ball once this has gone and to, you know, to not just hope for um, a return to kind of the new normal or going back to the old normal, even as it were, um, but be bold, be visionary um, and make yourself heard. And now I've gone massively over time. And so yield back to either. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. Welcome seat at the table is definitely very nice for us to collaborate with institutions that can amplify also what we are trying to do and we're indeed trying to change this narrative um, and looking a bit more holistically at systems and how it's not that young people don't care sometimes there are just flaws in the system that keep us out 
Um, so I would like to also um, thank all the all the young people throughout the months who worked on on this paper. Um, I think um, we are going to skip the video. Uh, we will just post it uh, and then post a link so you guys can see it uh, online since we've gone a little bit over time and I think it would be good to also offer a space uh, for for exchange. So I'll just give word to Marek. He will be presenting a little bit about the paper and about the journey. And then we will open also a discussion um, to the audience to uh, to share their views on on the whole process. So Marek, I will be sharing my screen. I have a little presentation. Um, I hope this works. I hope so too. Hello. <laughs> And thank you, Seth, for uh, passing the word. And thank you to Joe and Richard for um, the very uh, um, inspirational speeches. Mine will be more uh, practically oriented on the actual results of the um, of the process that led us to this point and the creation of the uh, policy paper that was created um, in the in the last few few weeks um this is a very this has been a very interesting journey for eyp because uh the organization has focused more or less on um organizing events and developing young people um in in various ways but we haven't really gone into the space of um you know having youth voices amplified to an extent and having decision makers um, hear what young people in Europe think about um, various uh, challenges that the world is facing. And this is a step in this direction. And this is what this project has been really about, moving the UIP to a bit of a different space and, and uh, serving it, serving as an amplifier of, of youth voices. This, this whole process has been centered around a series of events that happened for obvious reasons in the digital space throughout this year, um, where young people were asked to um, share their views on um, various challenges in the health sphere. And in the usual format of, of resolutions, uh, those were then uh, put together and uh, in including results of a health poll that was circulated, circulated in September and August. Um, these results were then put together by a group of people who met for a very unique physical event in, in Berlin, actually in September, um, with uh, a surprising number of people actually being able to physically show up and only very few people being uh, stuck at home due to restrictions. Um, and there at the event, the, the point was to take all of the content that was uh, produced by the young people and put it into the format of a uh, policy paper. I was very impressed with the content that we were dealing with and the actual result that we have, which I guess sounds like a bit of a humble brag, but that's not what it was supposed to, what it was supposed to be. Um, but yes, the, the contents that we came up with were not um, created only by the people who met in Berlin. Those were really uh, crystallization of, of what young people are thinking and um, I just wanted to say that um, I think what came out of this project project and this process if you compare it to what you see in regular policy papers uh, created by professionals I think uh, you can actually see that in some ways this exceeds uh, some of the products that you see in real life in, in quality um, so I think it's testament to the um, potential that this element of the EYP's work can have because we can really create something that can have an impact and significance and so that would be for the uh, general intro uh, if you can uh, then move to the next slide Isa um, some of the main messages that we um, wanted to amplify um, and that the paper really speaks to is that the youth are aware of the current global healthcare challenges and they want to see the relevant systems meaningfully evolve uh, to, to respond to these challenges. So we're coming back again to the fact that there's this status quo that various stakeholders are have an interest in maintaining, but 
what young people see is that systemic change is absolutely necessary. And we see that the young people who uh, contributed to this process within the EYP have concrete solutions handy uh, to create resilient and accountable systems that work to promote a very broad and ambitious goal of, of global uh, social justice. That was a very underlying um, message as well. Moving on to the next slide, we have um, we have here some general principles or a summary of some um, principle findings or gui guiding principles that came out of this process. The pursuit of universal health coverage has been a very significant uh, leitmotif of, of this whole um, of this whole paper and this process. Um, another aspect is the health in all policies approach, um, meaning that um, we have seen that health shouldn't be viewed as a separate category, but rather as an overarching uh, policy area that has implications in other policies and needs to be viewed as such. Health is also considered a global public good. Um, and the, the, the global word there is very important because uh, uh, as COVID-19 has showed, showed to all of us, um, health is really not a national or a local affair, but especially in these circumstances, it needs to be thought of in, in global terms. And as I said before, the resilient and accountable uh, systems are also a key key tenet of, of the future future of health. Um, we've, we have four pillars that we um, centered the process around, uh, first of which is health governance, um, where the conclusions of the paper are that um, on an institutional level, uh, we need strong governance structures uh, in the health sphere. And on the European level, there needs to be a very clear common European vision. Uh, because without that, uh, and with, with the current um, prevalence of nation states, some of the overarching challenges, continental challenges, cannot be properly addressed. The role of the WHO has been a, um, a very, um, you know, one of the motives that we, um, that we uh, talked about as well, where it was concluded that the European Commission and the EU should be the champions for a strong WHO, where other actors on the international stage seem to be uh, now rescinding their support for the WHO with the US being the prime example. And it is the, you know, now is a time when the European Union can really step in and take the leading role in promoting that body. Um, greater cooperation among member states is another, um, another element that needs to be strengthened. Again, uh, COVID has, has shown what this could look like, such as um, you know, medical procurement that can be coordinated between um, member states as, as a current, current example. Um, moving on to the second part of, of health governance, um, we have transparent communication as a very key um, area as well where uh, the EU institutions are encouraged to uh, increase the sharing of data, um, for instance, making research an open access uh, category of, of data um, and, and really uh, committing to being transparent in the way that it communicates uh, about health, health issues. Um, the accountability of institutions is, is a very, um, that's very much connected to the uh, transparency um, aspect of it, where it needs to be understood that the accountability is towards towards the the citizens um, who have the right to um, to influence the um, the way that the institutions are handling the, the health policy. And lastly, um, building trust and combating misinformation is another very key aspect these days when we see the rise of um, mis misinformation, especially around COVID now, when these things can really have a, um, 
um, negative effect and can really cost health and lives of people and it needs to be addressed also on an institutional level according to the um, young people whose, whose views are represented in, in this paper. Second pillar is the access and infectious diseases pillar um, where the unrestricted access to care was the overarching uh, vision and the, 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 the main goal that should be uh, achieved in, in this sphere. Um, addressing discrimination as a barrier was uh, a key component of this as well, where uh, the EU and the relevant institutions need to focus on the uh, groups that are um, underserved currently in the system and that uh, are facing uh, specific challenges that need a specific set of responses. Uh, so being uh, receptive to that is really key. And again, the, the, in the current uh, COVID uh, situation, um, securing additional resources to ensure global equitable access to a COVID vaccine um, is, is a very key element as well. And that has to do with the accelerator that was mentioned by Richard earlier as well. And the European vaccine strategy, for instance, and the need to adapt the EU's regulatory framework um, so that the, uh, this whole process can be, can be handled well. Healthcare innovations is our third uh, pillar that we discussed. Um, where this centered mainly around the, the e-health and telemedicine and that was also uh, I think touched upon by, by Joe before um, where the e-health solutions that are currently available need to be people-centered um, they need to allow for new innovative solutions um, for instance uh, by regulating the responsibility um, and liability of healthcare professionals when using the e-health e services in order to um, to really make it people-centered. Um, and that has to do with the protection of patients' rights as well, um, where um, this has to do with, for instance, personal data uh, that need to be safeguarded um, currently, um, not only in the context of GDPR, but in general, in terms of protecting uh, people's uh, privacy and, and their rights. Um, and another key aspect is the increased cross-border cooperation because um, as some of you may know, the current systems are very much um, um, incompatible um, on a cross-border level. So every member state of the EU, for instance, is pretty much uh, working within their own framework in terms of e-health and increasing the interoperability is a, is a key um, key element in, in, this, in this space. Um, yes. Mental health is the fourth and final pillar that is included in our paper, where this is an area that's, uh, that's very often uh, neglected by, um, by politicians and, and healthcare systems, as can be demonstrated by the fact that these the mental health disorders affect some 25 percent of uh, the population of the eu but only five percent of the health budgets are dedicated to to combating these uh, disorders um, the priority of preventive measures was pinpointed as a as a crucial uh, um, crucial element where the current systems seem to be more reactive than preventive and this needs to uh, improve in terms of working with communities um, and, and really making sure that uh, the, the mental health disorders don't even surface rather than just then dealing with the uh, consequences. Better education is of course uh, another key aspect that was, that was mentioned there. Uh, education around mental health. This, of course, is hugely important these days in the context of um, social media and the the effects that the new technologies have on people and where we don't really have the tools to uh, assess um, what what these new what these new um, 
technologies uh, do to our psyche. Reduce stigma and marginalization. Again, this is especially important in some communities that uh, are, are targeted um, and that have a disproportionately hard, harder time uh, dealing with, with, these, uh, with these disorders and these situations. And last but not least, uh, the effects of the pandemic have also been uh, clear in the sphere of, of mental health, um, where you know the, the the new paradigm that people find themselves in and the, the increased anxiety that is connected to COVID-19 um, needs to be tackled and uh, needs to be taken into consideration. All right, and to, to conclude, um, as you saw from the previous slides and from the summary of the content that I just provided, Young Euro's perspectives on the future of health are very ambitious. Uh, there's a lot that can and should be done to um, foster well-being for all people at all ages. And the question is, and perhaps it's something that I could open up to the, the rest of the panel, will institutions live up to the challenge? And perhaps then I would, I would turn to, to um, Joe first and just pose the question first, if you have any general reflections on the paper itself and whether from your experience, the presented outcomes are something that the institutions could actually adopt and what the real life prospects might actually be. I will have to be careful. <laughs> I, have, I have personal views, but also um, I have to obviously represent something else. Um, if you took a few data points, so you could look at um, a really good example. So one of the things you're calling for a lot is 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 proper cooperation and and the transfer of power to frankly European level of stuff. Um, so there's two really big examples of this. So one is the what's called the European um, Health Record. Um, so the idea of having one health record which you could read anywhere in Europe, you just you, you're, any doctor could read it. Um, it could be on your phone. It could be whatever. They've been talking about this for more than 20 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it's not a, it's not like, it's not a crazy new idea or anything like that, but literally 20 years and they can't agree. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's even simple stuff like that. Um, I mean, it, it, the example you always use for, um, I mean, is, is the mobile phone phone world. So what, what most people forget is that a mobile phone didn't used to talk to other mobile phones. Everyone wanted to own their own network. Um, and that's how they wanted to, to, to commercialize it. But actually what happened was whenever they started sharing and saying that my Apple can talk to my Samsung, et cetera, that's when mobile phones exploded. Uh, and you try and make the same argument around healthcare and, and lots of people have been trying that. Um, another really tangible example is uh, what's called health technology assessments. So health technology assessments is how you kind of um, work out whether a, a, a drug or a, a piece of medical technology is, 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 is effective and uh, cost effective. And they do it in every single country differently. And last year, they tried to harmonize it and just say, hey, why are we doing this 28 times in 28 different member states? Does it not make way more sense just to do it once? And then everyone agree that like, that's the cost benefit analysis. Couldn't do it. Um, so it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's a real struggle. Um, and there's lots of people who are really going for that. Um, so <laughs> the, 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 the sad thing is that, that if you look backwards, the omens are not good, um, <laughs> would, be, would be one, one reflection. However, in some way, COVID has obviously changed those calculations massively. Um, now what that will produce, who knows, but I guess that would just be my, one kind of reflection, like lots of the thing is what you said, every, lots of the things that you said are really ambitious. They're really big things. And if you could even get one of them, that would be transformative. So I guess that's my question to you is like, what's the one thing you want? And maybe it's something like we want Europe to take more of an active role in um, health policy. Great. Unfortunately, they've just slashed the budget from 12 billion to 1 billion, but hey, <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, 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 you can, you can still fight for it. The, the, 
and, and go call and make and, and, and pick up the phone and, and get out there and, and, and make that your one thing. Um, because you mean, it, it's, it's obvious that better, better, more cooperation is the right thing to do, <laughs> but getting, getting, getting it, getting it from the, the, the theory to the, 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 the change is if you look backwards, it's, it's not looking pretty. COVID may change stuff and now is, now is the time to speak up. Um, over to you. Right. Thank you. And um, I mean, it, it is to some extent a grim assessment, but perhaps, yeah, as we saw, COVID has really changed everything. So maybe it can change this as well. Um, I think if I, if I were to pinpoint one thing, perhaps again, coming back to COVID, I think one of the, um, one of the key takeaways was the approach to, to, to vaccines and the fact that the distribution of the vaccine should bear in mind that when once this is created, it should be considered a global public good and not something that one nation in the EU that creates it will then uh, use it for its benefit, but rather that this is shared on a, a basis that promotes a global uh, vision rather than a local or national one. But uh, but yeah, you are right that uh, there's there's a lot there that probably will not happen in the near future, but um, yeah, we can yeah, we can still be ambitious, and then maybe if we even pick up on, on one one strain, we'll be we'll be we'll be happy. Um, Richard, maybe over to you. Do you have any general remarks on the paper, and do you, do you share the 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 grim vision, or perhaps do you see from your perspective any of the areas that you think could be uh, more likely to be uh, picked up? I think I'll probably start with the second question. Um, I think probably the area that at the moment is kind of ripe for change um, and that everybody everybody sees as ripe for change is uh, global health governance. Um, and, you know, we've had prior pandemics. WHO has been criticised pretty much after, after every single pandemic. If you look at how they handled Ebola, um, they were criticised for that. If you look at how they handled Zika, they were criticised for that. If you look at how they handled SARS, they were criticised for that. Um, so that kind of criticism has happened after every pandemic. It's almost kind of a ritual. Um, but I think this time it's different. Um, and that's because even though, you know, WHO has lots of flaws, there are always lots of things you can criticize the organization for. They, they did a, a whole lot right this time around. Um, and still we've got this massive pandemic that's like ripping around the world, um, has killed, I think, 200,000 people by now, um, has infected millions and millions. And what it shows is that WHO, a flawed organization as it may be, is not responsible for things going wrong. Um, and it actually needs to be strengthened because it is is kind of our best shot. Um, and these conversations are going on at the moment. So there is, for example, a new, um, a new panel, the IPPR, the um, Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness Reviews or something like that. Um, as I said, we here at Welcome are doing some thinking around how global health governance can be can be transformed, and we also see appetite from a lot of states for a transformation, um, and also from the EU, um, which is um, incredibly important because ultimately WHO is driven by its member states, and if there is no appetite for change from the member states, nothing is going to happen with WHO at all. Um, so I think probably that area, uh, including the call that the EU um, engage more in, in global health governance and help strengthen um, the WHO's role. I think that's a very timely one. Um, the question there, of course, is, as usually, the devil's in the detail. Um, so the way in which, in which e the EU decides to, to try and strengthen WHO is going to be absolutely crucial, I think. Um, be it through, through more financing, through finally overhauling its uh, very old council conclusions on, on global health, 
um, and so on and so forth. I think there's a there's a whole lot of stuff that can be done and a whole lot of stuff that needs to be done. The question is, A, will it be done? And B, how will it be done? Yeah, I think that's, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you. And hopefully um, we will see meaningful change in that regard as well. We will see how much influence perhaps the current um, you know, criticism from all sides and especially from the White House uh, has had and what the future will hold, especially after November 3rd uh, next week. So maybe that, that, that can have an impact as well. And uh, perhaps there, the, you know, as was mentioned before, the approach of America can actually be a window for Europe to, to take the stronger role. So maybe there will be some um, positives there for, for this continent too. Um, maybe one more uh, question for Joe, uh, and that's concerning what you shared in the, in the chat actually. And if you, if you could um, share some of, uh, some of the conclusions uh, from the reports that you uh, put together on the COVID recovery from a youth point of view, if there's anything in particular that you think could be, uh, could be spelled out here. Um, so I mean, I won't obviously go through 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 the whole report, um, but I, and, and to be clear, it's a, it's an evolution. So so that was part one, and obviously COVID is moving quickly. Um, so we're we're also doing research on 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 part two. I think the headline is that in terms of young people, the, the, the this generation has obviously been hit by the, the economic crisis in two thousand eight two thousand and nine. Um, at a pretty inappropriate time in their sort of normal development path into jobs and things like that. And now we've got, they've got double hit almost by, by COVID. Um, so there's a, there's a huge concern um, about how we help that uh, or this generation um, really rebalance. Um, and, and it's going to be critical for a lot of the things that you're also calling for in, in, in your paper. So much, much more transparency information sharing um, about what's going on, how is it going on, better, better metrics to, to look at um, the, the young, young people um, and, and how they're progressing in, in the normal versus how normal progression would be. Um, obviously funding to, to make sure that, that any kind of um, drop in, in, um, access to jobs or uh, training and those kinds of things are, 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 is made up in some way. Um, and um, yeah, and again, just better and more mechanisms, at, especially at European level, to empower um, youth organizations and civic spaces, um, because that's, that, that, that space is shrinking and that's scary. Um, and, and I mean, we could talk for hours about this, but that's not the purpose of today. Um, but, but it's just why it's so great to see these kinds of groups uh, coming together and um, sort of not spontaneously, but sort of on their own volition, um, wanting to, to speak up and have a view on something which is hideously complex and really difficult. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I think that the people assembled here are EYPers who are very passionate people you know, also use, everyone is used to difficulty, which, uh, which can be, uh, you know, it can be helpful. It can also be destructive in some ways. And, you know, we, but we do, our events are always intense and uh, um, we are used to doing a bit more than I think your usual European would do. Um, and now, you know, we have been trying to, um, to go into this new space and I think we will approach it again with a high amount of energy uh, as well to contribute to the strengthening of the youth sector. Um, if anyone has any questions feel free to raise your hand. In the meantime I'll have one more question for Richard. Um, or actually I could turn to, let's see, I don't see anything there but Richard you mentioned that uh, you are hoping that the cooperation with UIP could uh, 
continue further, could you reflect on what the value of the partnership has been so far? And perhaps could you provide a, some sort of a teaser of how the cooperation could, could progress? And I know you might, your hands might be tied to some extent, but uh, yeah, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marek. Um, that question is a bit of a poison chalice because ultimately I unfortunately um, don't make the funding decisions, but um, I can, of course, uh, can, of course, make suggestions to the people that make the funding decisions. Um, I think what we have both sort of, or the ways in which we have profited from the partnership is, so for Welcome, as I mentioned, youth engagement isn't something that kind of traditionally we're very good at. Um, and, and especially not in a kind of sustained and, and very coordinated way. Um, so we, um, we do have various areas um, and various kind of disconnected teams which um, engage with young people on, on a variety of issues. Um, so we, we do that quite systematically with, with mental health. Um, and, and one of our projects, for example, was, um, was called COVID Living. Um, where we sort of invited young people from around the world um, to sort of write a diary um, about their experiences and their mental health um, during the COVID crisis. And things like that are obviously uh, really interesting and, and quite pertinent and I think help raise issues, but they don't come up with kind of youth-driven solutions. Ultimately, it goes through us and, and we're a kind of uh, conduit, as it were, um, to, to then try, try and identify kind of cross-cutting issues and then try to find solutions and then feed those into the political process. Um, but, you know, um, that is obviously not the same as young people coming up with solutions themselves. And I think in that regard, um, this entire process has been, has been incredibly valuable for us in having you as a partner um, with people who are uh, willing and, and able to, to do the, the hard work of, of not only identifying the issues and not only just pointing out the issues, but actually finding the solutions. Um, and uh, I was, I mean, as you know, Marek, um, I was um, at the think tank a month and a half ago, um, and I was incredibly impressed by just the kind of the energy in the room and yeah the, the willingness to to effect meaningful change um so that's something we've profited on um and in terms of what we have have kind of brought to this partnership i think um obviously we have not just the connections but we've also got quite a lot of expertise um just by, by virtue of, you know, um, being quite a large um, institution, which is, yeah, just pretty academic on the whole. Um, and I think us being able to just provide some input from, from a very specific perspective that we as kind of an independent foundation have, um, has also been, been something really beneficial that we brought to the partnership. Um, in terms of how this can continue, um, I think it's going to continue beyond this year, at least to the Milan event next year in, is it correct me if I'm wrong, April, I believe. Um, yep, yeah, April. Um, and, and after that, we'll kind of have to see. I think what's, what sort of what we're keen on for, for you to do, it, as I said at the Think Tank, is kind of make the splash um, and kind of try to um get your get your conclusions and get your ideas to sort of the big ticket names so um obviously people in the european um commission um or people in the european parliament or what we can as well come help with is reaching people in the uk government or reaching people in the german government um and i think if we could, could continue this partnership on that basis that would already be a huge success All right, thank you so much. And uh, I, I can say from my experience being at the think tank and, and the events that was put together by a 
cooperation between the EYP and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, uh, certainly, this seems like a very nice fit, and I hope that there will be ways of um, carrying it forward. Um, I don't see any questions right now from the audience here. I do see, I did see a flicker there, but I think it disappeared. Um, but yeah, if, if you guys have any... There is a question. I can jump in. I see the hands. I don't know if you do, but Julia has a question. No, we see Julia as well. You do? Yeah. Great. Julia, over to you. Hello. Thank you so much for organizing this. I think I can probably speak for most of us that whilst the second corona is like wave is hitting Europe and lockdowns are happening, it's incredibly energizing to see that there are so many people working towards more sustainable solutions. So thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I'm a European international law student in the Netherlands, and I've been really dipping into global health policy um, throughout my whole studies. And so I'm wondering now, because we also tackled the role of the private sector and the role of the WHO and then specifically national governments also, I see, for example, there are initiatives by the WHO, such as the patent pool, and which was also already existing with a different organization. Um, but for now, it's completely like dependent on the goodwill of the private sector companies that are in part also publicly funded even in their research. And I was just wondering um, what possible solutions there are to kind of make governments more active in taking their role and responsibility in, for example, making the private sector participate in innovations such as a patent pool, which would in essence really speed up innovation and access to medicines worldwide. Richard, perhaps, do you have any thoughts on that? I do, and I have some personal thoughts on that, but I also know that Welcome has some thoughts on that. So I think in this instance, I'm, I'm probably going to go with Welcome. Um, so I think you're right that um, kind of patent pooling can be um, a way forward in some cases, but it's also always quite, quite important to, to bear in mind that there is kind of no one size fits all solution. Um, so for some instances, voluntary pattern pooling. So for example, they've got um, issues with technology transfer. Um, voluntary pattern pooling can definitely be a way forward. They've got um, instances where technology transfer is the main barrier to access. Um, but that's certainly not the case for, um, for all these kind of innovations. And I think at the moment, um, sort of our, our view from sort of a bird's eye perspective on the system as a whole is that probably technology transfer isn't the main issue. That being said, certainly um, the WHO could have been more responsive and could have done more to promote, um, promote the Costa Rica proposal, for example, for a patent pooling system. Um, in terms of mandatory patent pooling or um, or using um, trips flexibilities, so um, stuff like, uh, sorry if this is going right into the weeds, so stuff like um, mandatory licensing and so on. Um, you've, got, you've got to be incredibly careful because some of um, the research ecosystems, so for example, um, in, in vaccine R&D, are quite fragile as they are. Um, and there is always a risk of, of companies stopping engaging altogether with these um, with these areas if you um, take away the prospect of of IP. Um, that said, obviously, you know we are in in favour of everybody having access, and we are in favour of working together um, to achieve that. So I think a corporation like the Act Accelerator, which has representatives from uh, from governments from private foundations like us, um, from civil society, from industry. I think that can potentially be um, quite a good way forward and quite an encouraging way forward. Um, and then there's also other formats that have been tried out. So for example, the so-called AMR Action Fund that's been launched um, not too long ago, um, which tries to, to encourage um, innovation in antibiotics um, to avoid sort of um, antimicrobial resistance um, becoming uh, the next pandemic. 
Um, in, in these cases, the state or states rather um, try and, and come up with kind of new um, incentivization uh, mechanisms um, for research. Because I think what we shouldn't forget is that, yes, you're right, that there is an incredible amount of research going on that is publicly funded. Very often, um, that is kind of basic research, um, which is great, which we absolutely need. But um, the existing mechanisms that we have for funding research quite often stop short of then also funding the translation of the brilliant basic research that's going on with public funding um, into sort of the finished product. And this is where, where the private sector has sort of carved out their niche um, in developing that basic research into the finished product. And as long as we don't kind of find a way of, of funding the entire system publicly, um, that niche is probably probably there to stay. I think that's um, a welcome conform response to that. Great, Joe. Did you have any thoughts on the <laughs> interplay? I, I, I would have. And just to be clear to everyone, I'm not just some sort of weird youth forum person who actually knows loads about healthcare. I worked in healthcare for the last 15 years, <laughs> so it's um, it's uh, I've. I've I've known, I know a fair of it. Um, I've got lots of personal views, but I don't think the Youth Forum has, has anything on the patent protection necessarily that we want to go into. <laughs> All right, that's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks. If I may jump in, because we have run over time quite a bit, I would like to thank everyone who's, who's stuck to the, yeah, to the program. Um, I don't see anyone else uh, having a question. So unless you're very quick um, and I see you, I will be wrapping up um, and it doesn't look like. So yeah, so then we can come to a close. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Mark, so much uh, for joining today. And thanks everyone in the audience and the live stream also on Facebook um, for following, following the event. Uh, it's definitely been really insightful, uh, both on the content side of things and how EYP or youth networks can move into also a content creation um, and, you know, how it's been a good reflection on how we can put our views out there and what needs to happen um, for institutions to also listen and how we can make use of existing spaces to, to amplify our voices. So in that sense, uh, I think we will take all the reflection from this conversation forward and see how how EYP evolves. And for that, I think I I would like to extend my appreciation to everyone who's supported us in the process. It's definitely been a good push um, for the network, and it's a very interesting um, kind of outlook for us. And yeah, I also want to extend my best wishes to the European Youth Forum. Uh, and Joe, you were mentioning earlier how it's transforming and how you're also evolving in a, you know, slowly but surely. And I hope to see EYP also take forward that, that dynamic. So um, to everyone else, you can join us in the next events of the Health Forum tomorrow and Friday. Uh, tomorrow we will be focusing a little bit more on the content side of the paper on health innovation um, and on Friday, we will be focusing on health governance. So if that is interesting to you, go on our website, register, and see you tomorrow. Um, yeah, so thank you, everyone. I hope you have a lovely evening and see you soon. Thank you, Isa, for leading this. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.